I want to begin by uh, telling you about a, a movie I saw a couple of decades ago. It's called The Earthling. It's a story about a family from America who went to Australia to visit the outback. They rented a motorhome, husband, wife, and one little boy who was about 12 years old. They drive way into the outback. They're looking around, seeing things. One evening, they park their motorhome on a huge, flat rock slab at the edge of a cliff, and they're making supper. The woman's in the motorhome making supper. The father's in the motorhome with her. The little boy's playing around outside the motorhome. And the mother says to the father, would you please just back the motorhome up a little bit away from the edge? And so he gets in it. She's in there cooking. He puts it in reverse. He steps on the gas. He hits the gas too hard. The tires break loose, begin spinning. The motorhome begins to slide. He panics, slams on the gas, and the motorhome literally goes over the cliff with the mother and father inside, lands upside down, and kills them both. And so here's this little boy by himself, 12, year, 12 years old, in the Australian outback with no idea how to survive. He climbs down the cliff to the motorhome, cannot even see his parents. Thankfully, they're crushed inside. And he begins wandering through the outback, through the woods, through the forest, through the wilderness, crying, stumbling, get himself all cut up. For several days he's doing this. He's hungry. He's exhausted. He's filthy. And as he's doing this, he encounters a man who was born in the outback wilderness, who has gone out and lived in the wider world, who is dying of lung cancer, and who has decided to walk back in to the little homestead where he was born and to die in the very place on earth where he was born. And so these two meet each other. The old man is very disgusted to meet him because he knows he should help the boy, but he knows that if he takes the boy out, he's not going to get to his destination to die in his homestead. He has a huge disdain for this little boy, tries to leave him and walk away from him, and this little boy, of course, follows him. It's like he's the only human being I've seen in three, four, five days. And so he follows this old man. And the old man decides, I don't have time to take him out, but I will teach him how to survive and let him go out himself after I've died. And so this boy walks with the man, and the man teaches him how to fish, teaches him how to get clean water, teaches him how to set a snare for a rabbit, teaches him how to clean himself up in the woods, and they walk together, and they get to the homestead. When they get there, they build a fire. They're sitting around this fire eating something. The old man is very near death. They're talking about life, and the old man says to this boy one single sentence, which I don't think I will, will forget as long as I have memory. He said, I always made the mistake of thinking that today was some sort of rehearsal for tomorrow. I made the mistake of thinking that today was some sort of rehearsal for tomorrow. Let me read you a, another passage. Luke chapter 9, verse 23 Jesus was saying to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Here's the mistake we make. We think, well, today's uh, just a day to get by. Today's sort of practice. Tomorrow's the real thing. Today's just a day when I'm going to, you know, make life work whatever way I can. Tomorrow I'm going to start pursuing God. Tomorrow I'm going to stop doing X. Tomorrow I'm going to start doing Y. Tomorrow's really the day. And so today's just sort of a practice. Today's do-overs. Today's a throwaway deal. So if you want to follow in your outline, I want to ask you to think with me a little bit about this question of the dailiness of the Christian life. And Jesus' message in Luke 9.23 is, today is the day that I need to follow him. Today is the day I have to take up my cross. Today is the day I have to deny myself. Today is the one day that I've been given to be a person who's going to pursue Jesus in a very serious way. Today is my opportunity. And it is actually, frankly, my only opportunity. On your paper there, I wrote a big idea. I said the Christian life is a daily life. The Christian faith is foundationally about today foundationally about today. 
Now, I said there, there are some things about yesterday. There's some past days that are important. There's the day that God created. There's the day of the fall. There's the day that Jesus paid for my sin. There's the day that Jesus was resurrected. There's the day of the ascension. There's the day I trusted Christ. There's the day you trusted Christ if you did. The day that you understood I have a, a major sin problem. It separates me from the God of the universe. It's beyond my ability to fix it. If I try my entire life, I will never work it off with God. I am completely without hope. And perhaps there was a day when you understood that Jesus had paid for your sin and that you could simply make a decision at the heart level to put your trust in Christ and be forgiven. To make a decision that says, I'm not going to trust in being a good person, going to church, being better than my neighbor, doing religious things, giving money to an orphanage. I'm going to give up on all that, whatever I had my hopes in. I give up. I put everything in the sacrifice of Jesus. Jesus becomes my plan A, and I have no plan B. Hebrews 9 says, it's appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. That means that every one of us, at some point, will stand before God by ourselves, not, not with other people there, where it won't be anybody to point their finger at. I'll be there by myself, God the Father. The judge will sit at the bench and say, Dave, why should I forgive your sin and let you live in my heaven with me forever? I've been rehearsing my answer since I was 19. I'll share it with you. I know it very well. Father, you should forgive me because Jesus paid for my sin. Period. Zip my lip. End, end, end a comment. And if he says to me, Dave, what else? I'm going to say, I've got nothing else. It's, it's everything. I'm putting all my hope right there. He is my plan A. I have no plan B. It's a very important decision. It's a decision you could make right at this moment if you have not. I made that decision almost 41, 42 years ago. It defined the whole rest of my life. It was a very important day for me in the past. But today is the day that I have to pursue God. There are some important days in the past. There are some important days coming in the future. The, there's the day that Jesus returns. The day that those of us who have trusted Christ sit down at the marriage feast of the Lamb. There's all kinds of days in the future that will be important, but the, but the Christian life is foundationally about today. There is no faith on earth as solidly grounded in today as the Christian faith. There is no faith on earth as solidly grounded in time and space as the Christian faith. God completely honors the fact that he made us material beings. He completely honors the fact that we live in time, that we are not people in eternity, but we are trapped, as it were, in time. We, we're living in a moment by moment. We have to wait for Tuesday, unlike God. God honors the fact that we are people who are created in time and space material people, there is no faith like the Christian faith that focuses on today. So in your outline, I said, here's a couple of the general truths about the Christian faith. First of all, the one I already shared, today is the performance. Today is not the rehearsal. We're not practicing for anything today. Today's the play. Today's dress, today's not dress rehearsal. Today is performance. And I, I'm very convinced, friends, that Jesus engaged fully and intentionally in every day he had. He never came to a day and said, oh, I'm not going to really get her done today. <laughs> not going to really pursue the Father today. John 4, 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. He just said, I am nourished by doing what the Father wants me to do and I'm focused on that today, he never, ever, ever had a throwaway day. So we are people who live in this day, fully engaged in this day. Today is our one day. Core truths about the daily Christian life. Here, here's, here's some ideas about the fact that God values the day. He places major focus on the day. The Bible is full of focus on today. Let me give you some examples. You know them, I'm sure. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Today has enough troubles of its own. Do not worry about tomorrow. 
Jerusalem if you had known in this day the things that make for peace. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. In other words, deal with your anger today. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, Joshua said, in this day we will serve the Lord. So the Bible is just overrun with passage after passage after passage that says life is about today. Life is made up of days. The way I spend my days matters to God. There's no throwaway days. The way I am living today is the way I am living my life. If I am squandering today, I am squandering my life. If I'm not pursuing God today, I cannot say that I am a person who's after the heart of God. What I am up to today is what's defining my life. God has huge value on what I do, think, say, and what I value in this day. <clears throat> the, daily, the Christian life is a daily, daily life. What, what if my whole life were lived exactly as I'm living today? What if I lived my entire life just exactly like today? Would I be able to come to the end of it and say, I was a person who loved God. I was a person who pursued God. I was a person who pursued the Word. If my whole life were extrapolated on today, what, what kind of a life would I have? I put in your outline some core truths about the daily Christian life. It is an indicator of where my life is going. The way I'm living today is an indicator of where my life is going. You can, you can sort of project my days out and see where I'm going to end. I was staying at a hotel in Colorado a, a few months ago, and uh, I got up early, took my Bible out to the little patio they had out there, and there was a whole bunch of tables. And there was only one other person there. There was a woman there who uh, had clearly just gotten out of the shower because her hair was, was still wet. She had a cup of coffee, two Mountain Dews, and a pack of cigarettes. And she was sort of firing herself up for the day. Now, don't want to be too condemning ever because, man, I love a cup of coffee in the morning. Not a big Mountain Dew fan and don't smoke. But uh, I, I understand she was just sort of getting some stuff in her to go for the day. And I'll bet you, friends, if she stayed in that motel for 10 days, you could find her on that patio every day for 10 days with her hair wet, a cup of coffee, two Mountain Dews, and a pack of cigarettes. I mean, there was a pretty, you could pretty well predict where she was going to be every morning. It's what some writers call path dependency. I get on a path and I stay on that path. I get in a rut and I stay in that rut. I get in a set of habits and I stay in those habits. Our lives are lived very habitually and therefore today can tend to be a very clear trajectory of where I'm going to be. I could take today and extrapolate it and in most cases you'd know what my life is going to be. Now here's the good news. Even though we can get in a rut and even though we can tend to live each day the same as the next day, we can also change that direction. Ever, ever been playing a sort of sandlot football and you throw this gorgeous spiral pass, the best thing you've ever flown, thrown, and the guy's down there, he's going to catch it, and it hits a tree branch? Boom, right down to the ground. I mean, it was on this beautiful trajectory, and it hit something, and it went a different place. I told you that to say our lives can go a different place. We don't have to go in bad places. There's a woman named Marilyn Ferguson who said, our past is not our potential. Because of the power of God, because of the power of the Holy Spirit, because of the Word of God, because of community who cares about us, we can be on a different path even if we've been on an ugly path. We, by God's help, can spend our days in different ways if we need to. Some core truths about the past days. So as you think about yesterday, there's some days to remember. The day you trusted Christ. Uh, remember the day of God's kindness to you, some victories. Remember the day of your wedding. Remember the day of your child's birth. There's some great days in the past to remember. A few weeks ago, I was in Boise, Idaho. I shouldn't say it that way. A few days ago, I was in Boise, Idaho. My kids, my, my son and my daughter-in-law, uh, had saved my birthday package for when I got to be with them personally. And my wife wasn't there, so we got on FaceTime so they could watch me open up my birthday gift. And I open up my birthday gift, and there's a onesie in it, a little baby's deal in it. I'm not going to forget that day, friends. I've got grandchild number five on the way, and I'm extremely happy. 
And I will remember the day I took that little child's uh, jumper out of there and looked at it like, oh, what a happy day. It's a great day to remember. You have some great days like that in the past. In the past, you have some things to forget. You have some sins that you've done and confessed that you need to forget. You need to just leave them behind. You need to just say, God's a God who redeems my life. You have some things about yesterday to forgive, some injuries that were done to you, some grudges that you may be holding that you have kept yourself in bondage. Not the other person in bondage, not the person who harmed you, yourself. You have some things about the past that you need to forgive. You have some things about the past you need to stop obsessing on, some big mistakes you made, some stuff you regret. You have some things about the past that you need to learn from, some opportunities you missed, some things about the past to avoid in the future, maybe some ways you harmed other people, and some things about the past you need to be grateful for, like the, the day you came to faith, the day the light came on, the day your child or your grandchild was born, some things to, to be really grateful for. And you have some things about the future days that you need to really focus on as well. You need some things to hope for, some things to envision, like the return of Christ, personal maturity, a whole lot of positive things, some things to plan for. While I'm arguing that we need to live completely and terrifically focused in this day, the Bible still says you've also got to plan for tomorrow. You've got to do some things. Friends, I have a father who's 87 years old who has not planned for the future. I was visiting here a few months ago. He had to borrow $20 from his son to go to lunch. Now, I'm happy to give my dad 20 bucks. I'm thrilled to give him 20 bucks. That's not the point. The point is he has less savings than my granddaughter. He hasn't planned for the future. There's some things about the future that we need to plan for. There's some things about the future that we need to not obsess on. Today's worries are enough for today. And there's some things about the future that we need to not presume on. James says, come now, you who say tomorrow we're going to such and such a city and earn a profit. You don't even know what tomorrow holds. We have no idea what it holds. Proverbs 27.1, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. We don't, we don't know if tomorrow is ours or not. We, we, we have no idea if, if God's going to give it to us. It's nothing that we should ever brag about. So centrally, friends, I'm saying there's things about yesterday and the past that we need to be thankful for and things to forget about. There's things in the future to plan for and anticipate and, and trust that God will bring about, but the Christian faith is primarily about today. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. One of our songs we talked about, you know, there's, there's times on the road when the sun is shining on us and everything's happy. We can say this is a great day. There's times in our life when the road is full of sorrow and darkness, and this verse still applies. Today's a great day because it's a day I know God. It's a day I have a chance to engage God. Today is the day we have. You know the very famous saying, yesterday is gone, tomorrow is not guaranteed. It is trite. I know, it's, I know it's embroidered on 14 million pillows in the world. I'm sorry, it's still true. It's the day that we have, the day to pursue God. And so the way I'm living today can be extrapolated to see how my life is going to be. A writer named Ken Boa put it this way. He said, it is obvious in the Gospels that Jesus knew his followers would struggle to hang on to their faith in him. And one word he used several times gives a clue to the fact that they knew that he knew they would struggle to hang on to him. The word the word is daily. The Christian life can only be lived one day at a time. The choices must be made again and again and again and again. Will I focus on the temporal or the eternal? We must choose each day whether we live as if this world is all there is or we can view earthly existence as a pilgrimage during which we learn and grow and we get prepared for eternity. So quickly for we forget we are aliens, strangers, and sojourners. Quickly we forget the brevity of life. We deceive ourselves into thinking we have all the time in the world. We don't have all the time in the world. We have today. We have today to pursue God. I have a great friend down in Houston. He was in the church I pastored there. He was a lover of bicycles. He bought me a gorgeous bike. He maintained it for me. Every time it had a problem, he took care of it. I moved up here 
sat in my garage for six months, and I called him and said, Brian, my bike tires are flat. It needs some work. He said, bring it down. I bring it to Brian's house. I leave it there. Great friend of mine. He texts me about every three days. Here's what's done now. Here's what's done now. <laughs> just, he's just meticulously rebuilding my bike. And then one day I get a text not from him, but from his son-in-law, who says, Dave, Brian went to be with the Lord today. Here's a 62-year-old man, 62 years old, fixes my bike, puts it in the spare bedroom, tells me it's ready, you can pick it up any time, Dave. Goes and mows his lawn, lays down on the couch, and goes to glory. Today is the day we have. Any one of us could go to glory today, any one of us. Uh, I understand I'm a lot closer than you are, but any one of us, today is the day that we have to pursue the Lord, to love the Lord, to honor the Lord. So central, central point toward the end of your paper, the Christian life is a daily life. It relates to us being truthful with ourselves about how we're living today. You know, I have a great ability to let myself off the hook. I mean, it's just, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a wizard at saying, it's okay, Dave, you didn't, you didn't uh, lift weights today, but you'll be fine. It's okay today, you, you, had a, you had three donuts before you went to bed, but nah, never worry about it. It's okay today, you didn't, you didn't answer all those emails that you said you would, but hey, let yourself off the hook. Uh, the ministry I work for hired an executive coach. I have to talk to him on Skype once a month for two hours. <laughs> I always dread it. I mean, I have this whole list of stuff that I'm supposed to do in this week, and I get on there, and how you doing, Michael? I'm doing great. And yeah. So let's look at your exercise log, Dave. Oh, let's not. I don't want to look at that. Michael holds me accountable. I'm better at exercise, quite frankly, after, after Michael became my coach because while I'm very happy to let myself off the hook, Michael's not. He's motivated. He, he's helped me. And so the question I want to ask myself and I want you to think about is, am I being truthful with myself about how I live in today and how I pursue the Lord. Let me ask you some questions. If I'm not going to seek God today, when was I planning to do that? If I'm not going to obey God today, when was I planning to do that? If I'm not going to witness for Christ today, when was I planning to do that? If I'm not going to pray today, when was I planning to do that? If I'm not going to love my wife today, when was I planning to do that? If I'm not going to respect my husband today, when was I planning to do that? If I'm not going to nurture my children today, when was I planning to do that? If I wasn't going to be responsible for the things God set, me, set before me, when, when was I planning to do that? I found I need to ask myself some very hard questions about how much I let myself off the hook and say, tomorrow I'm going to start. But today's the day I have. Let me give you a list of some ways to squander today. Fail to focus. Treat today as a rehearsal. Be discontent. Be a multitasker. Be doing two, three, four, or five things at once. In my judgment, that's squandering today. If I have failed to focus on one thing and then another thing and focus on each of them individually. Let me ask you a question. John 4, Jesus speaking to the woman at the well. Can you imagine in your wildest dreams Jesus texting while he spoke to her? Can you imagine in your wildest dreams Jesus saying, you're not that important to me. Uh, yeah, but I am the Messiah. You know, I mean, it's just insane. Cannot imagine it. Jesus was fully present to every person he was with. He's walking down the road going to heal someone, and this woman touches the cloak of his garment. She's been bleeding 12 years. He knows the power went out from him to heal her. He turns around and speaks to her, <clears throat> and he is fully present to her, even though she has interrupted a mission he was on. One of the great ways to ruin today is to be a multitasker. Another way to ruin it is to regret yesterday, to fear tomorrow, to ache for yesterday, to ache for tomorrow, to fail to be grateful, to forget that the Christian life is daily. These are all great ways to ruin today. Here's some ways to redeem today. Focus on this day. Live fully focused in it, one thing at a time. Refuse to live in the past or the future. Pursue God in this day, your family in this day. Recognize this day as a gift from God. 
Recognize it as your only day. Rejoice and be glad in it. Remind yourself today is a gift. It's the one day I have. It's been given to me as a gift. And I'm going to be a person who, who's not going to squander it. It's not going to be a throwaway day for me. I'm not going to make the mistake of the old man in the Australian outback who thinks, this is a rehearsal. Tomorrow's the real thing. Tomorrow's when I'm really going to start pursuing God. Tomorrow's the day when I'm really going to start being a person of integrity and obedience and loving my family as I need to love them. Friends, the Bible says uh, a man will live for 70 years or if by strength 80 years. There's about 29,200 days in 80 years. If a person got to be that old, they would live about 29,000 days. You know how to make a faithful life? Just one faithful day at a time until you've stacked up 29,200 of them. You can't make a faithful life if today's not going to be faithful. I want to close with a little physical illustration today, uh, and I, wanna, I need some helpers. I need the youngest person in here. How are we going to figure that out? We sent the kids away. Right there, buddy. Can you help me? Come up and help me one second. All you have to do is stand here and hold a string. Thank you. What's your name, please? Jeremiah, great to meet you. How old are you? Ten. Today you're going to have to pretend to be zero, okay? Stand right there, face these folks, hold this string right there. I need somebody who's about 20. Somebody courageous? I know there's a bunch of you in here that are about 20. Please, young lady in the purple shirt. How old are you? 13? You look 20. This ain't going to work. Somebody who is 20, be courageous. That's perfect. That is perfect. Golly, what a difficult crowd. Okay, there's a little, little knot right there. Hold on to that, would you? Now it gets harder. Somebody who's about 40. Thank you. Did your son just volunteer you? You're probably only 32, but anyway, we're going we're gonna to let you hold this. Do we have somebody who's, uh, who's close to 80? Sir, how old are you, please? <laughs> are you close to 60? Hold the 60 knot for me. Beautiful, beautiful. I'll put you under there. There's a knot right behind you. Turn around, face the crowd, and hold on to this knot right here. Beautiful. So I'm going to take the 80 knot, even though I'm only a mere 61. So, friends, look at that string right there. There's 0, 20, 40, 60, and 80. If you made it this long, you would have lived 29,200 days. So out of those 29,200 days, here's the question. Which one of those days is most important? Any courageous person? Today. Today. So every person holding on to that point in their string, if they're 10, 20, 40, 60, 80, whatever point of the string you're holding on to, that's the important day. You can't even see the little knot I've tied in here that all five of us are holding on to. It's just, it's just miniature. In terms of 29,000 days, it's, it feels like nothing. But it's the one important day. Thank you for your help, friends. That was pretty easy, wasn't it? Thank you so much. Did not even make you sing or anything. Thank you. Jeremiah, you did great, buddy. Can you guys give him a round of applause there? Thank you so much. That poor lad sitting there thinking, I should have gone to Sunday school because this old man is making me come up front. Friends, I've been thinking a lot about this because I'm a person who has spent a huge amount of my life just planning for tomorrow. A huge amount of my life thinking it's going to be better tomorrow, it's going to be good tomorrow, I'm going to start obeying God tomorrow. Uh, I, I'm going I'm to start exercising tomorrow. I'm going to be 
more thoughtful of my wife tomorrow. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do all these things tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm going to be more careful with my credit card. Tomorrow I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do better. God has just convicted me powerfully about the reality that today is the day to pursue God. There is no faith in the world more solidly planted in today than the Christian faith. And if I want to say I'm a lover of God and pursuer of God, it has to be today. Friends, in just a moment, we're going to take the Lord's Supper together. I'm going to invite you to come up and uh, take the elements and just hold them till the end. Pastor Sam is going to lead us in uh, taking them together. And uh, just before we do that, let me remind you what Paul says, that, that as you come to the Lord's Supper, uh, we, we are people who need to examine our hearts and say, Lord, uh, I want to confess everything to you. I want to, be, I want to come to you uh, with my sins freshly forgiven, obviously forgiven permanently in Christ, but also in a day-by-day -day walk where I'm daily confessing my sins and doing what we say, keeping a short account with God. So I want to ask you as we, as we sing and reflect and as you come get the elements and then hold them for Pastor Sam to come up, just to be saying, Lord, what is there in my life that I need to confess to you? What is there in my life that I need forgiveness for? In what ways, Father, have I dishonored you in this day? In what ways have I dishonored you by my mindset that's either thinking I'll start obeying you tomorrow or that's aching for yesterday? Uh, how do I need to confess to you, Father? Let me pray for us a moment. Father, I bless you for your son who lived completely focused and obedient in each day you gave him. Thank you that though he is the God of eternity, who existed from eternity past until eternity future, he was fully present in each day. Let us obey you in that. And Father, as we come to the Lord's Supper today, we're going to take a time and, Lord, open our hearts to you. Please convict us of those things that we need to confess to you. We know your word that says everything is open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. You already know it, Father. So let us personally be honest about it. Please extend your forgiveness to us in Christ's name. Thank you for inviting us to this corporate worship. Thank you for inviting us together to your table. We praise you in Christ's name.